time, and, and I encourage you to continue to do that. Um, one of the reasons why we, we decided to start this church is um, there is this huge disparity between, you know, what we, what we hear and what we do. Um, the idea of transformation and life change um, is kind of something that is for a few people, but it's not necessarily for everyone. Um, and when we look at the body, just being 100% honest, you know, I've been in ministry for since I was in my, since I was 20. And the one thing I know is the, the not everyone, but often the biggest goal is to get as many people in the room as possible. It's not necessarily what what's happening to the people when they leave. Um, the, the, the last church that I was in, um, that was that, that's, that was the conversations and, and the leadership is let's double the numbers, let's double the numbers. But the question is, you know, would you take half the numbers if everyone in there was becoming more and more like Jesus? That's the number one question. Um, he didn't share. I'm, I'm going to let him tell you what he wants to tell you. But one of the things that uh, when Austin and I were sitting, um, he was just he was sharing with with me some of the breakthrough that he had had in his life. Some chains have been being broken. And the funny thing about it was, as he's telling me about this, um, <laughs> two things happened. One, there was a guy sitting outside who began to... When we, when we first came in, I, I've seen this guy because I do my sermons out of there, or I work on my sermons out of there. Um, he's, he's, just got, he's got some spiritual issues, to say the least. Um, and so when he came in, it's often when I'm in there, he's always staring at me. Um, I've had conversations with him, but he's, he's, got, he's got some issues. But um, he's sitting outside, and as Austin is beginning to proclaim the chains that are being broken off of his life right now, this guy just starts to go just nuts outside. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing that happened. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to share everything because that's the point. Um, the other thing that happened was there's a guy um, sitting in there next to us. And I met with him afterwards, but this is what happened. He said, he, he said, um, he told me, he said, this, this guy talking about Austin is sitting over here. He's got this Colgate smile, and he's talking about the Lord, like how excited he is. This guy's guy's name is Kev. Kev is a believer, and um, but he's been going from church to church, and he actually his father was an uh, uh, served a traveling evangelist, and so he had been going around the country with his father. He'd been raised in this, and he just saw, but he saw in in just. Watching him, he didn't even know fully everything that he said. Just watching him, he witnessed transformation that he hadn't seen. And he, so as we're leaving, he gets up, he comes over to us, he says, hey man, what, what church do y'all go to? <laughs> and so, you know, we ended up meeting where you guys will see him eventually. Um, but here, here's why I make that point. That is the way that church should grow. Plain and simple. You know, we can put like a bouncy castle outside. We can, you know, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, we can do a banner. Like we can do like a pop in social media. But the reality of it is, when you read the early church, they were they were a group of guys who were transformed, and their transformation helped other people become transformed. When I'm when I sat down with Kev, Kev was almost in tears, explaining some of the things in his life, and what what. How he grew up, all this. I mean, and and I respect the dude a lot. He's he's coming out of a lot, but all of the the the, the pain and the issues that he's had, he saw freedom when he looked at 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 um, Austin. Now he wouldn't explain it like that, but that's what he was. That's what it was. He he saw freedom, and his his response was, "Hey, what are, what are y'all doing?" Now keep in mind, this guy is like a hard dude. Like he's not, he's like a tough guy. He's not just a He's, 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 he comes from a culture that you just don't do that. You, you wouldn't go to someone and ask them. But because he saw transformation in Austin's life, he wanted to be a part. Amen. Amen. The reason why that's a, a big deal is because I just want to set your standards, guys. Like, that's what we're looking for here. That's, that's what we're trying to do as a church. We're, we're not, you know, I've been a part of ministries where this is probably the smallest ministry that I've been a part of. You know, I've been a part of ministries that were twice the size. I've been a part of ministries with that group of 1,200. 
Transformation has nothing to do with numbers. I promise you that. And because I know that there are some people that would watch this, I can't say. I, I'd give you specifics, but I don't want to give specifics because I don't want to uh, offend anyone. Um, but, yeah, what's up? No, I just wanted to share something else. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Related to that. Um, I guess, so, I guess the... Share briefly. Yeah. Well, it has to do with Papa John's again. Um, so Does it have to do with what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this this one woman who I work with about twice a week, um, every time I come in there, because she's a, a believer, but she's lukewarm, so she has her her issues, and she doesn't necessarily know how to go about it. Like her foundation is is not there. That's the point. So, um, and I just you know through like working with her and and all this mm-hmm. stuff, she's been. Like every week, she's always just like, man, you always have this calm, you always have this, like you're, you're, you're quiet, you never say anything, you never complain, nothing bothers you, nothing. All you're saying, and then she just starts like, um, she gets in a better mood. Now, with that, there's still, you know, issues with like, hey, you need to get in here and, and start doing this and this with, with, with God, so that way it can happen to you, not just you seeing me. Um, and you feel good only when you when you're around me or whatever. So, but the last few weeks it's been it, ever since I started working there it's been a lot better because she's been more so in focus, getting more in focus with what she can do with what what God can do with her, um, than than focusing on on the things around and what people do and what people say. So, um, yeah. Thanks, man. All right, so um, enter last week. Um, I want to worship, but we can worship at the end. What do you guys think? Sounds good. You want to worship? Yeah. Right now. Yeah. All right, bet. Um, so the other thing, especially since you're just your first time um, joining us, we're not big on like things need to go a certain way. Um, so. Full comfort for you. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Whenever you want to leave, you can leave. You want to lay out on the floor, (laughs) lay out. (laughs) I'm probably going to clown you. Um, But you can still lay out. Just want you to have full comfortability. Um, So I tell you what, let's do this. Let's worship. Um, And then I want to share. We've been going over the the armor of the Lord. I want to talk to you guys about the shield of faith. I'm only going to give you a little bit because it's a lot. Uh, next week we'll go over more. So um, I guess since it's on there, let's go ahead and worship now. Um, I'll have lyrics over there. Um, again, I, I, I'm going to tell you every single week because I think it's important. Let this let this be a time where we're not concerned about ourselves, um, but we're really taking the time to worship the Lord um, as if he's here, um, as if he's right next to us. So it's one thing to, to, to sing songs that we know or to sing the lyrics that we see, it's another thing to actually sing by faith as if we're singing to God. Um, the Bible says that we're two or three are gathered. Um, he's here. Jesus is here with us. And so if Jesus if Jesus was here with us right now in the flesh, our worship would look a certain way, am I right? But the reality is he's here with us in the spirit. Our worship shouldn't look any different. And so that's not me encouraging you to stand on your chair and go crazy. Um, that's not me encouraging you to stay seated. That's just me encouraging you, however you are going, you would worship Jesus as if he was here, worship him like that now, okay? I try and turn it up so the person next to you can't hear you. So who wants to recap the armor of God? Anybody? Go ahead, Lou. Well, one thing that I learned last Sunday. Just recap what the armor of God is. Don't tell us what you learned. I'm just joking. <laughs> Bro, I I see his face. No, the, the girding of ourselves. I, I always thought that was an actual belt. Right. Until you actually explain it, and it's like to prepare ourselves, you know, be ready to run or whatever. Right. And then, um, helmet of salvation is knowing that no matter what happens, the devil will never have a bed full of us. Because the worst thing that the devil can do to us is kill us. Mm-hmm. But to us, night is gain. Saved in Christ and the breastplate of righteousness. righteousness. And that we're, you know, we're righteous through faith, not of our own works, but through, through faith in Christ and 
much the only thing that we have to actually do out of all this is be ready. Mm-hmm. But then we have faith in our righteousness, mm-hmm. and then we know our identity, and we know like we're going to have it when we die. So let's let whatever comes. Mm-hmm. Amen. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Just to clean it or clean it. They go to the gospel and talk about gospel like, peace. Gospel peace and understand that we're steadfast. Uh, if we, uh, you know, if we just understand where we're standing and the ground with the gospel, what the word of God says about it, and that we may slip, but we're, we're not going to fall. Right. Mm-hmm. We're God. We've already paid for that. Uh, just to add that. Yeah. If you ever want to tell So let me read Ephesians 6. I'm in Ephesians, Ephesians 6. 10, um, I'm going to read 10 through 17 real quick just to recap us. Read now to Nazby. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And this is where where he talks about the armor. He says, therefore, take up the full armor of God. And he tells us why. So that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Then he says, stand firm again. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, ah, let me pause there. So Paul is saying, he's giving you something to stand firm. Here's the reality of of your spiritual life. When you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes into your spirit. That thing is incorruptible. Jesus says that that no, no man, no thing, can snatch someone out of his hand once he saves you. Amen. Amen. But there is no guarantee that you'll live this life in peace. The armor of God is what gives us peace. It's not what saves us. The spirit saves us. So Paul gives this illustration of this armor to put on. That's what they just talked about. The helmet of salvation. Right? Knowing that our life ultimately is eternal. So no matter what, if the the enemy beats us over the head, we have protection. At the end of the day, there's no, you know, the the head, when you're you're thinking about being in an army, the head is the ultimate death blow. You're more likely to survive a shot in the chest than you are a shot in the head, right? Paul is saying that you have, your salvation is what protects you from any ultimate death blow, right? Because at the end of the day, they can take your body, but they can't do anything to your spirit. Right. This is what Jesus says when he says, he says, fear God who can take the body and soul and destroy them. Right. Because he keeps our spirit. Then he gives us the, the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness we talked about last week does not mean right living. That's not what the definition means. That's not the intention. Righteousness means right standing before God. It means that when you say when you're saying that you're righteous, you're saying that. God is seeing you, not through your right living, but through Jesus' right living. That's what righteousness is about. The the, the funny thing about righteousness is, righteousness, the word that's used for righteousness, hey, look at that. The word, no, you're fine. The word that's used for righteousness is a Greek word that they use in their court system. It's It's what the judge would say when he declared someone not guilty. It was a word of judicial approval. When we say we're righteousness, we're talking about the declaration of the judge. We're not talking about you. So righteousness is where you stand before God. The breastplate of righteousness is to give us peace to know that no matter how much we fall, God still sees us as righteous through Jesus. And then the gospel of peace, the shoes of the gospel of peace. So many people translate that as as if it's evangelism, but it's not. Because the, the shoes that he's talking about, that's why it says shod, your feet shod, which means to bind under. It's saying having bind, bind it under your feet. When it's talking about shoes, he's, he's talking about the, the shoes of the Roman guard. 
At that time, the, the, the Romans were the first in having cleats under their shoes. So when, when he was referring to their shoes, everyone who was reading this letter would have thought immediately about the cleats. That's why it says to bind under. He's talking about the cleats of what? The gospel of peace. The gospel is that Jesus came to die for you, but it's a gospel of peace if you've accepted it. Because what that means is your merit has nothing to do with you. It's peace. So here's what this means. The reason why we need to be armored with that is because we know that the truth of the Bible says this. We read it a few weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians 5.25, is that God is going to sanctify our body, our soul, and our spirit. The word that he uses is, 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 is that we translate as soul. The actual word is psyche, which means your mind, your will, your emotion. So God wants to sanctify your, your, your body, he uses the word soma, your soul, psyche, and your spirit. Here's why we need the armor of God. Your body and your soul still are full of, the, of, of what the Bible calls the flesh. That's why you get saved and you don't get skinny, right? If you got saved and you got skinny, that would be super dope. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't happen, right? Just like you don't get saved and you don't get skinny... You don't get saved and you're automatically delivered from disease. Some people do. I'm, not, I, I, I'm never going to be one that's going to discount supernatural. You'll never get that from me. But it's still true. Some people will be saved and they're not immediately delivered from sickness. Just like you're, some people are saved, you're not immediately delivered from depression. So Paul is writing this letter because he knows that just because you get saved doesn't mean you're going to have peace. That's why he says in 11, 13, 15, stand firm. With the armor of God, he's saying this armor of peace is what's going to allow you to stand firm. This is why the, the armor of God is why Christians can have cancer and still have peace. Amen. So today I just want to go quickly. I'm going to go very, very quickly into faith. All right. Um, faith is a lot. So I'm going to talk two weeks about faith. All right. Um, so in 15 or sorry, 16. Ephesians 6.16, 6, he says, in addition, in addition to all of that, he says, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. Amen. Now, here's the thing. We can talk about the armor of God all that we want, but there's a problem. Most of us don't consistently live in that peace, right? Forget about that. Ephesians 1, 3 says that God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every single spiritual blessing. Just call them out to me. What do you think are some of those spiritual blessings? Peace. 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 Love. Love. Joy. Joy. Kindness. Kindness. Anything Love. else? Patience, wisdom, wisdom, understanding, healing, right? Discernment. All discernment, it's a lot, right? Here's the, the problem is those things. Sorry, this is my oh this is this is this is my depiction of you. Your soma, soma's body, right? Your soul, your psyche, your spirit. Here's the problem with the with the armor of God. The armor of God goes here. So does all the spiritual blessings. They start here in the spirit. And the problem with the armor of God is the armor of God is, is very difficult for us to understand with our body, with our touch, our taste, our, our, our sense of smell, our sense of hearing. Because you don't, you don't hear it, right? You don't smell it. Your mind, your emotions, your I, that's subconscious. I don't know how to spell conscious, so mm -hmm. con is another words. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey man. You don't gotta be smart. You just gotta love Jesus. So um <laughs> somebody said amen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um <laughs> so the problem is God gives us every spiritual blessing here. Now let me ask you, is God a liar? No. All right, so God is not a liar. He's true. So everything that happens here is true. We just don't know how to understand it with our body, and we don't know how to understand it with our psyche. The victory in the spirit is these spiritual truths 
making their way into the flesh. That's what advancing the kingdom of God is, right? It's, a, it's, what, it's literally what Paul says in Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised you from the, or who, read, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is in you, then I'm confident that that spirit can also give life to your mortal bodies. So when we look at advancing the kingdom, I wish I could write this way, but I'll do it. So we'll just take peace, for example. You know, you know what's funny? What no one said? Power. I'm such a power guy. Like, when I, when I talk about, like, feeling as though the Lord has, has constantly slowed us up, of, of not really wanting, of wanting to get to certain things and not have, not being able to, power is that. There's so many things that I want to share, but we got to get, we have to understand some things first. This is one of the things we have to understand. The advancement of the kingdom is taking these spiritual blessings and having them make their way into your psyche, to your soul, to your body, and to your soul. That's what the advancement of the kingdom. This victory is real. This victory, these truths are real. We just don't understand how to take them in. So these things exist. Just because they're invisible, it doesn't make them untrue. It just means that like you've had to grow in your understanding and growing, you're using your body. How many of you guys were a kid at one point? So who popped out of the womb and just started walking? <laughs> <laughs> so you don't pop out the womb and start walking, right? You have to first understand what you even have. That's why babies always chew on their feet, right? They're like, what in the world is this thing, right? But what? They're always like, babies are amazed at their body. Am I right? They're just like, what? And the, they're, they're understanding their body. And then slowly they begin to learn how to use it. So just like you had to do that in your body, when you grow up, growing up, maturing is learning how to use your psyche. It's learning that just because I take something with you from you, it doesn't mean that you scream at me, right? You, kids don't even understand why they're angry so much. I'm talking about little ones. You take something from a little baby, he goes crazy. Maturing is understanding what his emotions are, what his mind is, what his psyche is, and beginning to learn how to use it. So just like you have to understand and learn how to use your body, and understand and learn how to use your soul, you have to understand and learn how to use your spirit. How often in your spiritual life have you tried to understand what is it, what's it like for me to, to be spiritual? So, advancing the kingdom within is about taking spiritual truths and bringing them into experience here. There's power in there. It just has to advance. So in Ephesians 6.15, Paul is, he brings up this shield. Ale, you're really going to like this. <laughs> Here's why. So when Paul says he has a, we have this shield of faith, Here's 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 what I want to make to you, because most of us, when we think about a shield, we look at a shield as a defensive weapon, right? Yeah. Okay. Paul's not saying that. And I, I'm going to prove this to you. Um, so first off is in the words that Paul uses. Paul says thurios when he says shield. The reason why that's important, remember, when Paul is talking about this armor, he's talking about Roman armor. That is the only army that they know. So he's talking about Roman armor. At that time, the Roman army had three different types of shields. One was like more like a showy shield. Kind of anytime you've ever seen Gladiator, it's like a real showy shield. Another was a small shield that they used for close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And another one was a big shield. They call it Thurios. It was, it was an oval-shaped shield, almost the entire size of the body. Now, this is what this shield was used for. This shield was used... Not to just defend, but it was used to advance. And here's how. What they would do is, the Romans were so dope, they, they would get on the battlefield, they would have people stand together. They have maybe five to ten people stand in the front with their shields up. 
Then they would have people stand behind them in rows with their shields up like this. So it would create a shell, a shell over top of them. And they would advance. And they would advance with the engineer in the middle. They would slowly advance and they would begin to set up more and more defensive structures. Why? Because the army would slowly advance, set up, slowly advance, set up, slowly advance, set up. The arrows that they were blocking were arrows from the other army as they were trying to advance. Do you know what they called the formation? Testudo. Because it moved so slow, like a tortoise. And it was covered in shield. So it was faith, it was, it was protection, but it was protection so that it would advance. So Paul is saying our faith is protection, but it's protection in advancement. Now here's the thing. I promise you, this is not me just stretching, right? This is not a metaphor that I'm trying to make work. Our faith protects us from an enemy, but it's protection as we advance the kingdom. So just as a Roman soldier would look at a shield and they would inst instinctively think advancement, that's how we should look at our faith. Here's why I know it's not a, stre a stretch. Turn to 1 John 5, 4 real quick. When somebody gets there, you tell me when you're there. Five, verse four. This is what he says. This is what he's talking about. He says, whatever, oh, let me ask you this. Does God overcome the world? Yes. Boom. You don't even got to believe. be a believer. Like, you pretty much know if you believe in God, you're supposed to think that God overcomes the world, right? As believers, we definitely believe that, right? This is what John tells us. He says, for whatever is not just God, but born of God, is that you guys? Okay, so whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You guys have heard that before, right? You guys are overcomers. Anybody heard that? But this is what he says. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. So John and Paul are in agreement. They are both saying our faith overcomes the world. For most believers, faith is a thing that you hold personally. And you talk about it amongst other people who believe. But both John and Paul are telling us that faith is not something that you have just to hold and cherish. Faith is a tool that God gives us so that we advance the kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. First John is telling us that as children of God, we can overcome the world out here. That's what when, when he's talking about the world, he's saying all of this stuff, this flesh, we can overcome that. But it's our faith that does it. So the arrows that we need protection from, they're not attacks. They're defensive arrows of an enemy who's having his territory invaded. I know this to be true, and, I, and I've shared this before. When Jesus says, when Jesus says um, I, I build my rock on this, and the gates of hell will not prevail, this is why he's saying the gates of hell. Because the enemy is in defense. Even back in that time when you, when you heard gates, it, a gate wasn't just a gate. It, it stood for the entire defensive system of a, of, a, of a city. Because most back then, most cities were guarded by gates, around gates. So he's saying the gates of hell won't prevail. Only provided that you fight with faith. That's the big deal. Because what you have to understand about what he's talking about, this is where, this is where our faith intersects with our armor of God. When you put on the armor of God, do you know what you're actually putting on? You're putting on Jesus. Amen. That's why in 1 John it says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So your faith in what Jesus has done for you allows you to put him on. It's what's ever born of God overcomes the world, not born of Mark and Valencia. That's my parents. It's not, it's not, it's not whatever's born of Nancy and Bo. Right? And not whatever who insert your parents, insert where you come from. That's not what it is. So here's here's the thing. I'm gonna give you a quick snapshot of faith, 
and then we'll really peel it out next week. So what I want you to do is, I want you to go to Ephesians 11. I'm sorry, Ephesians 11. <laughs> yeah, find that. Go to Ephesians 11. 11. You find it? <laughs> Alright. Just want to make sure you paid attention. Go to Hebrews 11. There's no Ephesians 11, y'all. I wanted to see who, who would be front. Like, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> Hebrews 11. So listen, guys. This is All of this stuff is beginner. This is beginner Christianity 101. Like, no, none of this is like, it's not supposed to be mind-blowing. These are things that we are just supposed to know. But to be honest with you, I just don't think we know. Not, not y'all. I'm just saying just the church in general. Most of, most of faith, what faith is for people, is one of two things. It's either a set of rules and practices that you, you align yourself with. So you say, I'm of the Christian faith. Or it's like weird, magical words that we think if we use these words, then God's going to act. That's typically how we view faith. But in Hebrews 11, we get a different picture. So, uh, I probably should have went there myself. Huh? All right, so I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll open it up. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. Then he gives us a couple examples. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained... The witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Then 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Amen. I'll come back to it, but I just want to hit right there. Faith, we get right in verse 1, a simple definition. Faith is the substance of the unseen. Hebrews 11 1 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Faith is assurance. So if I could write it on here, I put it, I won't write it. Faith is assurance and conviction. <laughs> but it's not just assurance and conviction by itself. It's assurance and conviction of these things. Things that we hope for. Anybody hope for peace? Anybody hope for healing? Faith is the, is the assurance and the conviction of those things. You know what? Because I, I, I'm going to refer to it in a second. So I'm going to write one here. Sorry. Bear with me. I'm doing it over there. Oh, my. <laughs> so faith, assurance, conviction of the things that we see, the things that we hope for. If advancing the kingdom within is making the invisible visible, faith is the first step that we have to take. Take our salvation, for example. In John 1, Jesus says that no man has ever seen God. Why? Might know why? In John 4, Jesus says it's because God is spirit. Just real quick, a little quick workshop on the Trinity. One of the reasons why we get Jesus is because if we don't get Jesus, we have no idea what God is like. That's why Hebrews says Jesus is the exact image of God. So if God had a body, he would walk like Jesus. If God had a voice, he would talk like Jesus. Jesus is the actual depiction of what God will want you to understand him to be here. 
But God the Father doesn't exist out here. Well, he exists. He doesn't live out here. He's spirit. So no man has seen him. So even God himself, God is something that we hope for and something we don't see. But in verse 6 in Hebrews 11, he tells us that if any man would come to him, so over here we can put God also. This is terrible to me, right? My wife will be killing me right now. <laughs> so God goes over here too. And in verse 6 he tells us that if any man would come to him, that man must do what first? What does it say in verse 6? Go ahead, tell me. let me hear you say it loud. Believe that he exists and what? He's the rewarder of those who seek him. Not a vision, not a miracle, belief. Faith is the first step that God says. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. If you were to come to me, you must first believe that I exist. Why? Because God the Father, who is spirit, he does not submit himself to the flesh. Or the things of the flesh. For you to know God, you have to submit your flesh to the things of the spirit. Faith does that because it goes against the flesh that we value so much. Faith is the only bridge that we have between the two. You know, you know why this is important? This is why it's important for you to understand this. Because we think that if Jesus was to come into this, this room right now, and, there, and it was filled with unbelievers that unbelievers would believe. No, seeing Jesus is not a requirement to knowing God. Y'all know that, right? Yeah, if any man would come to him, he must first see Jesus in a, in a dream. No, it doesn't say that. It says that if any man would come to him, he must first be healed. It doesn't say that. It says if, if any man would come to him, he must first be delivered of pornography. It doesn't say that. He must first what? Believe. Faith is the only thing that takes the flesh and moves it to meet the spirit. That's why it's so important. The difficult part is that faith begins with the flesh and believing in something that you can't see. So now you have a, a, a body, a soma, your entire life you live with touch, feel, taste. Now you have to learn how to touch, feel, taste things that aren't there. God, God the Father who is spirit, Tells us, taste and see. How? Faith. So if we're going to begin to understand faith, we have to start with the realization that not seeing and not having is a normal part of faith. Matter of fact, it's a prerequisite. you gotta, you got to not see some stuff. Why? Because if, if, if faith is the assurance of things not seen, First, there has to be things in your life that you don't see, that you have hope for. We have to stop tripping. Like we have to be okay with praying and not seeing it immediately. That, by very definition, makes you a child of faith. We're people who are being saved by the things of the Spirit. Our identity should be founded in the things of the Spirit. We shouldn't panic when we don't see things that we're praying for immediately. Faith is the, is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. So if we're people of faith, we shall expect that there will always be those things there. The opportunity is there for us to grow in our faith. Any good parent is not in the business of giving their children everything that they want. Sometimes it's not that we want a car. Sometimes it's just we want a seat. It's a good want, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean something's not wrong in your life if you're praying to see Jesus and you don't see him. Here's, here's my, here's my um, so just to kind of give you some backstory, somebody prophesied over Darcy and us a while ago. Um, well, a few people, uh, it happened actually, I want to say about seven times. And one of the prophecies is this here. Um, and more particularly, that this would continue to reach younger people. Not younger, like younger than me. Like your age, where you guys are at, right? Here's the problem. My concern for your generation, for, for people who are y'all's age, is that we often think that the things that we call deep, 
We, we think that they're deep, but they actually show immaturity. Give you a good, good example. We have a huge desire for the supernatural, right? Anybody have a desire for the supernatural? I do this. Don't feel bad. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I have a desire for supernatural things. But our understanding is off because all throughout scripture, we see that signs, wonders, miracles, they were given to help strengthen faith. Amen. They were never the point in themselves. For most people, God's word is not enough. So, because God is dope, he confirms his word with miracles. God tells us that this realm exists. Most people don't believe him, so what does he do? He gives us a glimpse of it by healing. So God does this. He says, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm real. Here's what I'll do. I'll turn the deaf into hearing. In Acts 2, Peter is talking about Jesus and, and the miracles that he performed. This is what Peter says. This is in the, in the NLT, NLT because I think it, it explains it really well. This is what he says. He says, talking about Jesus, he says, God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene. How? By doing powerful miracles and wonders and signs through him. Peter is saying that God used these signs to make you believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Without them, most people wouldn't have listened. So the signs and wonders weren't a result of great faith. They were a result of lack of it. That should change our idea of maturity. How much do you need to believe? God actually has a higher value on people who don't need a lot to believe. Don't get it twisted, guys. Great faith is great faith because great faith doesn't need a sign. I remember listening to um, a guy who was a, a missionary in, in, to Peru, and he saw lots of signs and wonders being done in his ministry. And it was so convicting to me because he says, but his, the problem is the more I learn about faith and I read Hebrews 11 and I see that they, here are all these people who, had, who God says they had great faith but at the end of Hebrews 11, in verse 39, it says they didn't see what they were promised. But yet God calls them mature. And then he said, you know, part of me wondered, because before I came here, there were people who had been here for decades trying to preach Jesus, and they didn't see any fruit. He said, part of me wonders if maybe I was just too immature to be able to be here then when there was no fruit. Maybe God knew that I didn't have the faith to stay on the mission field when no one was getting saved. If you don't believe me, guys, take Jesus and Thomas. We know Thomas is what? Doubting, Doubting Thomas. Why is, why is, first off, how foul? Because whoever said that, he's just doubting Thomas until we all go meet Jesus. He's probably up there like, uh, that's going to dog me out <laughs> forever. <laughs> but why do we know him as Doubting Thomas? Because he said, he said, he said, I won't. They said, they came back. He said, Jesus is risen. Thomas said, I won't see. I won't believe until I see it, until I put my fingers in the holes. This is not, this is not to condemn you. God is still merciful. And God's so merciful that he said, he sent Tom, he sent Jesus to come back and to Thomas and say, here, put your, put your fingers right there. Look, Thomas, it's me. But at the same time, God's still God. So what did he tell him? He says, you believe because you have seen. But what? Blessed are those who, don't Blessed are those who will believe and haven't seen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. Like, here's the problem. Here's what concerns me for this generation. What concerns me for this generation is if you guys knew that Jesus was, was, was going to be somewhere tonight, or let's say last Friday, let's say Friday night I got to, we, we, we did something and Jesus came. How great would you think that event was? Amazing, right? But if we were to do it next Friday and Jesus is not there, we would think that something's wrong. But Jesus is trying to grow the faith in us that he doesn't have to be there. That we can say he's here because he said he would be here. 
Your excitement about Jesus being bodily there should match your excitement with the fact that Jesus said, we're two or three are gathered. And we think we need to have more of seeing him. And Jesus is saying, y'all, I, if that was the case, I would have stayed. Here's my concern. My concern for the generation is we don't understand that. And because we don't understand that, we think that the power is in that. God knows about this. He knows it's hard. He made you. He knows everything about your soul. Everything He knows it's tough. Signs and wonders are to follow believers. Listen, I promise you, I'm a signs and wonders guy. I pray for signs and wonders. You know why? Because the Bible says that signs and wonders should follow the word. We know that God is with us because signs and wonders follow what we do. So, so when I'm in there speaking to, to, to Austin, if someone has demonic oppression, that should happen. It's not the first time, won't be the last time. I've seen it enough. I used to open there and preach. If you're preaching, people will walk past you and demons will start to come out. I want signs and wonders, but signs and wonders are there because signs and wonders confirm to unbelievers that God is in the message. The signs are for the people not of the faith. But when we move like they're for the people of the faith, we're jacked. I'm not sure if you know this, but read your Bible. You don't see any healing meetings. You don't see any worship events. I'm not saying that those things are bad at all. I'm saying that if we, if we measure the movement of God by those things happening in the church, it's showing our immaturity. It's so interesting to me. Because I, I have most of my friends are super charismatic. We we want to have these meetings and, and, and we come together, a bunch of believers in there, just in the presence of God. Like, bro, you got it. Go. That's the purpose. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for each other to be healed. That's not what I'm saying. We should see those things in here. What I'm saying is. Whether God does or doesn't do those things, it shouldn't measure our joy. That shouldn't be our measurement. Because you have, if you're in pain the rest of your life, you're going to go meet Jesus. Amen. Isn't faith the fact that he's so good that you can still be in pain and he's still worthy of praise? Amen. Unbelievers don't understand that. That's why they need to be healed. I want everyone to be healed here too. just want to make that clear. All right, so let me finish up here. A miracle is this. It's something coming from out of here into the flesh. Something coming from the spirit into the flesh and showing you what the spirit realm looks like. That's why Jesus said when he, when he sends his people out, he says, cast out demons, um, heal the sick. He says, when you heal someone, say to them what? The kingdom of heaven has come near. Today, the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. Why? He's telling them, okay, this miracle is to point back to here. Because we don't understand what real maturity is, what we do is we, we, we set up shop at the miracle. So there's, there's, real, there's really no growth. It's just about the miracle. So here's what we do. Now we have to have another meeting. God was moving. Oh, man, God was moving there. We, oh, we got to have another meeting. We got to have the right music. Oh, my goodness. Dangerous. I'm telling you this is dangerous. Because as you grow up, I'm 34 years old, right? So I'm a little bit older than you guys. I promise you that the, 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 those type of events are not brand new. That type of thinking is not brand new. I've been with people in cars. seen this. I've seen people pray for the rain to stop, and it stopped over and over again. But I can also number the amount of people who do not follow Jesus now. Because it wasn't faith. The point was God wanted to show us that, look, I can stop the rain. Believe in me. They just kept praying for the rain. So now they have kids. They have a family. And there's no evidence of faith. Because when, when you have a family, you know, it's not about like trying to have fire fall down. You're just trying to get through the day. You got these eggs to make before breakfast. Patient with your wife, patient with your husband, patient with the kids. It's, life becomes more 
fuller. There's not time for the next miracles, the next wrecking. There is no life of faith. That's the problem. If we have this faulty view of what faith is, we can't begin to live a life of faith. There's no life of experience. It's just these stories that we share. What, what, what Ale shared is super important. He said he just, Ale experienced in a normal, nobody was there, just him. Just him and Jesus. That's what life should be like. Not, not having to go and hear a guru come and talk about it. And be like, yo, did you hear what he said? Oh, man, I was wrecked. Uh. <laughs> Listen, I'll be honest with y'all. And, and, I, and I'm not trying to flex on any, any other church. I'm not, I'm not doing that at all. But I'm just being completely honest with you guys. What Ale shared, what you guys shared, Shared in the beginning, I've been in rooms 10 times this size and haven't been able to find enough people where they're experiencing anything like that. You know what they are doing now? Get the guy, get the prophet. Bring the prophet. And I know some of those guys, and you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get people to experience that in their everyday life, but people could keep showing up to them like they're a fortune reader. Jesus sums it up really, really well. He shares a story about a rich man who dies, right? And the guy's in hell. And he's in hell, and there's a place called Abraham's bosom where someone that he knew is on the other side of the chasm. And he's, he's screaming out to this guy. He says, give me just water, water. He says, I'm sorry, I can't cross the chasm. Sorry, bro, you're in hell. This dude, he's so convicted. He said, all right, look, at least... Let me go back to my family and tell them not to live this way. You know what he tells them? He says no. He says, but surely if I go back from the dead and I tell them, they'll believe. You know what the angel tells them? He says, they have the, the, the prophet and Moses. He's talking about the Old Testament scripture. He says, they have scripture. He says, but if I, okay, that's scripture, but if I go back, they'll believe. He says, if they, will, if they didn't believe the scripture, they won't believe you. Uh, I wish you could understand. In the church, we don't believe that. You know how I know this? Let me bust into your, cool, your coolest Christian event and just be like, yo, let's just read Hebrews real quick. That, that, that vibe is going to go down real quick. Let me step, and I'm not, it's nothing against I, I want to have as dope worship as we possibly can. But I also want us to have a foundation where we say, we don't even need that. I'll be honest with y'all. I've worshiped in a room with just people singing. And it'd be spectacular. Here's how I know our maturity. As a church, I know we're not ready for that. That's why I got to go to YouTube. But if we, can, if we can do it by ourselves, there will be such a foundation of faith we think it's all these epic things. We think we just wake up one day and it's just like, yeah, I'm giving it to Jesus. I'm, I'll, I'll give my life for Jesus. But you need music to worship. How, we, how do we miss that? Oh, Jesus is great. You can't be patient, though. All right. So I'm going to end there because I've been running my mouth for a while. Um, here's my prayer for you guys. My prayer is that we understand that foundation, that our, our zeal and our passion is zeal and passion that crucifies the flesh. That when, we, when, we, when, when it, does, it doesn't hit our five senses, when we can't understand it, when it doesn't hit our emotions, we can still praise God. That's why I said before in worship, God, God is here. Like literally, if, if, if we were sitting before the throne of, look, I'm not trying to convict you. I just want you to understand it. Like be honest. If you were sitting before the throne of God, how would you worship? Would you worship how you worshiped a minute ago? Look, I know how to work. Like, I don't need y'all to keep coming back so I have a job. Like, that's not what this is about. Like, I, I want you guys to be fully who you need to be. John wrote, the, wrote Revelation on an island by himself. And he's getting visions. 
But it didn't come because, man, they had some real great worship or, man, the fellowship was great. They had great food. He's by himself in a cave. We should, we should be growing in God. The moment that you can come in here, and I think because worship is just a great example. The moment that you can come in here and worship as if you're sitting before the throne, you've got something there. You've got something there. That's when it becomes real. And that's what I want for us. And so next week, I'm going to be hitting on uh, faith a little bit more. And more importantly, because I, I just talked about faith. I didn't talk about how does that faith actually advance. Uh, we're really going to get into some dopeness next next week. And so um, anybody have any questions? Is there, are we talking uh, a little bit of the sword next week? Or? Sword is going to come the week after. All right. we're, we're, we're going all the way through it. Here's, here's why I, I go so slow. Because I didn't even peel out of that. I, I go so slow because there's little things about life, and, and, and more particularly, there's little things about this word that we just breeze through, and then we don't even understand it. We don't, we don't get it. So I can say you need, to, you need to have faith, but then we don't. See, if you understand even that, if you take the time to understand faith, now you understand when you don't want to read, and you read, it's more than just about a victory. God is pleased. When you don't want to read your Bible and you read it, God is happy with that. So now you understand that the times you don't want to read, that's the act of faith. Now when you open up your Bible and, it's, and the words are just on fire to you, I've had those times, that don't take faith. It takes faith when I don't want to get up, I don't want to read, I don't want to worship, I don't want to be patient, I don't want to be loving. Those are the times where God is actually pleased. But we're tricked, we're condemned. Oh man, I should be past this part. So we slow down and we go over it. All right. So, I mean, that's not even that's not even half the sermon. I just don't want y'all here all day. I don't want to be like Paul, have y'all sleep and fall out windows. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be a few weeks from now. Um, so here's what I want to do. Nate, I'm going to have you pray for us, man. I feel something on you, my, my brother. So just take your time and just pray over us. Father God, I thank you for the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. You place to visit us mm -hmm. according to your will. And Lord, we, we ask that you would increase our faith in every way, every way that we need it, every way that you've called us into. Father, I thank you so much for your peace, which surpasses all understanding. Yes, mm -hmm. You're a good, good father, and you care so much about your children. Yes, and all it takes from us is to have faith in you. Mm -hmm. so please teach us how to do that, how to increase our own faith how to live in faith um, with much expectation for what you are going to do in our life and in the lives of people around us. And we're just so thankful for you and, and everything that you've done for us. Mm -hmm. Jesus. 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 Amen. Amen. Amen.